Hey everybody, Rob Maurer here, and today we're going to be regrouping a little bit on what happened yesterday at Tesla's earnings report, as well as some of the new features with the updated Model S and X. Should be a pretty quick episode today, I think people mostly today just kind of digesting the results, and a lot of attention in the stock market today focused on the situation that's been unfolding with GameStop and some other stocks. Quick 30 second synopsis in case you haven't been following that situation, essentially hedge funds had been short GameStop significantly. The we'll call it a stock market discussion page on Reddit, Wall Street Bets, saw that super high short interest on the company. There was also a management change at GameStop, and collectively the whole internet, it seems like, decided to buy GameStop stock, go long, and somewhat force a short squeeze in GameStop. So that's been unfolding over the last week or so. The stock is up around 10x and seemed to reach a boiling point today when a number of different brokerages actually disallowed trading on GameStop and a couple of these other stocks. Robinhood has been getting the most attention here, but it wasn't just Robinhood. And sure, they can argue that this is for the user's protection, and it's a complex situation, but I think that's a relatively false argument. So personally, I think it's very disappointing to see some of those actions taken today, and I do hope that this leads to some reform in some way. It's certainly been getting a lot of attention. Elon Musk, for his part, was chiming in today, again saying, make shorting illegal, a sentiment he has shared in the past because, of course, at one point in time, Tesla was extremely heavily shorted as a percent of float, now that has declined over the years. Still a very significant dollar amount short Tesla, but as a percent of the shares outstanding, short interest now is much lower, somewhere closer to 5%, when in the past, at times, that number was closer to 50%. High short interest affects a company's valuation because it effectively creates additional shares in the market, and of course, as supply tends to rise, prices tend to fall. If a company is experiencing some turmoil that can exacerbate things, that makes access to capital more difficult and can actually play a contributing role in a downfall of a company. So in some cases, short selling can end up being rather predatory. Now, in the cases of a company that's doing bad things, of course, that could be a good thing. But how often is that actually the reality versus the negative impacts that sometimes short selling could have? That's kind of what's up for debate. For my personal take, I'm not inherently against short selling, but I do think there's a long way to go in terms of reforming it. I think there should be more limits put in place and additional disclosures required. But speaking of short interest, we did get an update on Tesla short interest yesterday. Obviously, it took a backseat to the earnings report, but Tesla short interest, otherwise known as the number of shares sold short, as of January 15th was 56.4 million shares. Tesla's share price on January 15th was $826, meaning the total short interest dollar amount would have been $46.5 billion. The last short interest update that we had discussed, I had noted that this is going to be an interesting one to look at because between December 15th and December 31st, the last two short interest reports, we saw the biggest spike in short interest that we had seen in a long time, with short interest going from 45 million shares up to over 60 million shares. And of course, the S&P 500 inclusion happened in between those two reports. So the theory there could be that some of that short interest was to help fulfill the demand for shares from S&P 500 index tracking funds. If that were the case, it wouldn't be too surprising to me to see that wind down back to the levels that we were at previously around maybe that 40 million share mark. So at least for the two weeks between December 31st and January 15th, that's what we've started to see short interest declining by 4 million shares. And as we discussed earlier, that effectively reduces the number of shares available, so should be at least somewhat of a benefit to the share price. The last thing to note on the short interest is that even though we did see that share count decline from about 60 million to 56 million, about a 7% decline, we did see the dollar amount increase by about 10% because Tesla's share price went from about $706, again, up to that $826 mark. The next update we'll get on short interest will be after market close on Tuesday, February 9th, and that'll be for the Friday, January 29th, tomorrow settlement date. As for today, well, we haven't even checked the stock price yet, so let's take a look at that. Tesla today, after earnings, finished down 3.3% to $835.43. That compared to the NASDAQ, that was up about half a percent for the day though it did trail off towards the end of the day. So essentially Tesla ended up closing right around where it was after the earnings report yesterday, even though it did drop a little bit further after the earnings call and in early trading today. Analyst reactions seem to be relatively neutral kind of across the board. A lot of people talking about Tesla's gross margin miss, earnings per share miss, but also noting the high growth targets. I think if you went in as a Tesla bull, you came out as a Tesla bull. If you went in as a Tesla bear, you came out a Tesla bear. And now we get to move on to seeing how well Tesla executes in Q1, which somehow we're already about a third of the way through. While we are on the topic of earnings, there is one point here that I want to clarify, and this is why I'm so thankful that we have comment sections, because it's clear in my head, but sometimes that doesn't always come across in the words that I say. So this is related to my thoughts on margin, and as I said, that was probably the most disappointing factor for me when the initial earnings results came out. Zach pretty much cleared all that up on the call, so no longer was disappointed after that. 
but still a really important point here that we should talk about. So John gave some great feedback, a couple others did as well, saying that he disagrees with me on my disappointment, far more interested in growth than improving margins. Musk is a master of improving margins, but now is not the time. Essentially, growth is more important. So I actually do fully agree with this comment, and that's why I need to clarify my thoughts because I say that the first thing that I'm looking at in the last few quarterly reports is that automotive gross margin X credit line. That's not because I want to see strong margins just for the sake of strong margins and good profitability. Why I look at that is because that's our best indicator of how Tesla is progressing on their costs. We already have visibility throughout the quarter to how Tesla is adjusting their pricing on their vehicles, but we don't get insight into cost progress until we see that gross margin line at the earnings report. That's also where we get the insight into how well Tesla is able to leverage scale, and that's how we get a better understanding of the long-term prospects for Tesla. If they were sitting there right now and had a 40% gross margin, for example, that would give us a ton of confidence that when the time comes, Tesla's got plenty of room to pull their prices down. If you're looking at something more in the 10% or 15% range for gross margins, well, then you're going to need something that's more of a breakthrough to get to that lower price band. So me just saying, oh, the first thing I look at is automotive gross margin probably doesn't fully get that context across. At this stage, I don't really care about gross margin. I don't really care about operating margin. I don't really care, definitely don't care about EPS, but I do care about what those numbers are telling us about Tesla's progress. So hopefully that makes more sense. If we do have another light news day tomorrow, I was thinking it might be a good idea to do kind of an earnings regroup Q&A type of thing. So if you do have some questions, let me know and that might help make that decision. But the last thing for today, I just wanna spend a little bit more time going through the refreshed Model S and X, some of the features that we didn't get to talk about yesterday. Tesla's order pages have now been fully updated, so go take a look through those if you haven't yet. But from that, we have learned now that the Model S and Model X have the ability for 250 kilowatt charging, so taking full advantage of the V3 superchargers, which had not been the case previously to varying degrees depending on the time frame for the vehicle. Speaking of supercharging, by the way, Tesla actually rapidly accelerated their deployment of supercharging in Q4. They added 383 new stations and just over 3,800 new connectors. So in just a single quarter, Tesla more than doubled what they did the entire year prior to that. Q1 through Q3, 360 new stations and 3,300 connectors. For the year, that meant the supercharger network grew 45% versus the total fleet, total number of Tesla vehicles on the road growing about 55%. So obviously those growth rates don't need to be identical. Really happy with that growth from the supercharger network this year, especially factoring in higher throughput from faster charging. Anyway, back to the S and the X refresh, both vehicles will now have the interior camera that has been present on the Model 3 and the Model Y since inception, but has been lacking from the S and the X. Tesla plans to utilize that for the Tesla network, so good to see it show up in these vehicles. As far as I remember, there is no current functionality for those interior cameras. And then also similarly to the Model 3 and the Model Y, the S and the X will now use the phone key rather than fobs, though I'm sure you could still order a fob. I doubt they'll come standard. Maybe the X would be different because of the Falcon Wing doors but we know Tesla loves to save costs and phone key is one of the ways to do that. Phone keys worked well for me. I know people have mixed reviews though on how well that functions for them. Lastly here on the steering wheel or rather the steering yoke, there were some photos that were actually buried on Tesla's website, I think in the hidden assets of the refresh with a full steering wheel. So we can see how that looks. And personally, I think I actually do prefer how the yoke steering looks. I don't think I would mind it for driving. I think it's probably one of those things that Maybe looks off-putting at first, but over time you realize it's not really a big deal. And I think it just integrates really well with how the interior comes together, providing that really clear view of that second screen. And if we look at this, I also imagine that Tesla has designed this so that the yoke steering can kind of contract into the dash and be stowable with full self-driving in mind. From that NHTSA document that we had gone through a few weeks ago, definitely clear that Tesla is thinking about those things. And this looks tailor-made to function in that way. As for these photos with the actual steering wheel, I would guess this is probably a regulation thing. There are probably some markets where Tesla would have to ship the vehicle like this. Oh, and I guess final note, if you hadn't seen it already, that 10 teraflop performance that Tesla is expecting here from the new Model S and Model X, that's pretty comparable to a PlayStation 5 next generation console. That's at about 10.2 or 10.3 teraflops. The most recent Xbox is at 12 teraflops, not necessarily directly comparable until we know all the other specifics, but Elon did say that it's capable of playing Cyberpunk, which is resource intensive to say the least, and has given the last generation of consoles a lot of problems. So this is some pretty serious hardware in the Model S and the X, and should open up some fun possibilities and some good revenue opportunities as well. So with that, we will wrap it up for today. As always, thank you for listening. Make sure you're subscribed and sign up for notifications. You can also find me on Twitter at Tesla Podcast, and I'll see you tomorrow for the Friday, January 29th episode of Tesla Daily. Thank you.